Hey guys, welcome to The Strong Young Man. When we were young, we were able to gather knowledge and abilities on all sorts of matters. A big reason for this is that an empty brain fills faster than a full brain. But another reason is that we recognised our limited knowledge, and we were more open to learning new things to change this. Being young was advantageous in this regard. The position of basic ignorance that we possessed as a child served us to gather knowledge and cultivate as many abilities as we could so that we were no longer incompetent. As we gather large amounts of knowledge and cultivate many abilities as we age, we believe that we know as much as is necessary and we become more rigid in our learning. It is at this point that we shut ourselves off to learning new things. The shift in attitude may come about because we have reached the age of maturity and we believe we should know everything, so we act the part. It could be that we develop an ego which requires us to know everything. It could also be that we have indeed learned a lot and we don't believe that there is anything more that we could learn. In all cases, we are presuming that there is a finite number of things to learn. Abstractly, this makes sense, but practically it could not be further from the truth. New knowledge is being uncovered every single day. Thomas Young, purported to be the last scholar on earth to know everything, died on the 10th of May, 1829. At the year 1900, human knowledge had doubled approximately every 100 years. By the end of 1945, that rate was every 25 years. Currently, our knowledge is doubling every 13 months, but with the help of the internet, our knowledge will eventually double every 12 hours. Learning about new things opens our mind up to new things that we didn't even comprehend before. By discovering new concepts, we will become aware of how little we really know. If we are able to move past our ego and accept the notion that we know very little in the grand scheme of things, we can paradoxically learn more than we could ever have learned as children. There is no limit to the knowledge that you can learn. You must approach life assuming you know nothing. Assume that what you know might be false. Assume the person that you are talking to knows something that you don't know. This intellectual modesty will allow you to learn more than you could ever comprehend. If you have your mind made up about a particular topic or belief, consider new data, new research, or other people's opinions. English lawyer and philosopher Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, once said, If a man will begin with certainties, he shall end with doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. Don't be so rigid to dismiss another's outlook without considering their thoughts and experiences. They may be able to teach you something that you don't already know. At the very least, they may make you aware of a gap in your knowledge, which you can explore at your own leisure, building up your knowledge even further. If you aren't open to listening to people, you will miss these opportunities when presented to you. You never stop learning. Every interaction is an opportunity to learn if you are open to it. If you are young, you should aim to maintain this flexibility in your thinking. Understand that the older you get, the more rigid you become, unless you actively fight against this tendency. Jordan Peterson captures the requirement for humility of learning in his book Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. It is better to presume ignorance and invite learning than to assume sufficient knowledge and risk the consequent blindness. It is much better to make friends with what you do not know than what you do know, as there is an infinite supply of the former, but a finite stock of the latter. When you open yourself up to learning anything from anyone in any circumstance, you will simultaneously open yourself up to new opportunities because you will be receptive to them. You will create better circumstances for yourself. You will earn more respect. And of course, you will learn things that you never would have learned. When you consider what this costs you, a momentary checking of your ego, it is well worth the price. What gives you the right to shut yourself off from learning new things or a new way of looking at things or that your current understanding of knowledge is correct? By operating under the assumption that you know nothing or that what you have learned previously could be wrong, you open your mind up to experiencing things as they are, rather than the way they appear from a perspective tainted by your previous experiences or learnings. Another way to learn is to welcome new ways of doing things. We enjoy what we are familiar with. It is in our nature to be reluctant to change our methods because they are comforting. People follow procedures that have worked in the past. Not many people stop to consider that times change and our practices must adapt to suit. The more you are entrenched with an old method or procedure, the more you will resist change. It goes against human nature to consider alternative ways of doing things. You must move past your urge to conserve the old order and methods and maintain an open mind to new ways of doing things. This is not a license to neglect the lessons that history can teach us. Humans can also have a short memory. We must not neglect the valuable lessons that history can teach us at the expense of exploring new methods. At various stages of your life, you must pause to reflect on what you have learned. Reflect on past situations. Your work is never complete. Reread great books you've read previously. 
you might discover something that you dismissed as irrelevant because it did not resonate with you at that point in your life. Understand that you are not now who you were previously. You have learned many things since the last time you read something. They might offer you new perspectives. No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river and he is not the same man. If you reread old literature, you may learn more from the second reading than you did from the first reading. This is especially relevant with very dense books, which have a lot of valuable information distilled into such short writing. Spend time actively learning new things that help you achieve your goals. This is a much better use of time than sitting idle, browsing on social media, playing video games, or listening to the radio. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Turn this dead time into something that is contributing to self-improvement. Dead time includes time spent commuting, doing chores, and mindless exercise. You can make better use of this time by reading or thinking and processing new concepts. Use this time to learn something new. There is always additional knowledge a man can know, even when he possesses the highest level of knowledge. Identify gaps in your knowledge and fill it with useful information. Focus on the things that you find interesting. This time should be enjoyable. Learn things that complement your life and you will change your trajectory into an upwards direction. It doesn't matter how you are working on yourself, as long as you are improving yourself compared to who you were yesterday. You should be aiming to fill the day with as many improvements as possible. Doing nothing means you have actually gone backwards. In the words of Benjamin Franklin, If time be of all things most precious, wasting time must be the greatest prodigality. Aim to accomplish two to three hours of self-improvement per day. This will add up to 1,000 hours by year's end. This is a massive step towards achieving life goals and satisfaction. In 10 years, you could obtain mastery in something. You are lying to yourself if you say that you are too busy to spare two to three hours per day. Everyone is busy, but everyone has the same 24 hours. People make time for the things that are important to them. What you really mean to say is that you do not value self-improvement enough to prioritize it above other mundane events that you regularly do. Take some time to reflect on what is really important to you over the long term. Here is how I structure my day. I sleep six hours a night, so I have 18 active hours per day. Take away eight hours for my full-time job, I have 10 hours left. In this time, I can read approximately eight hours worth of audiobooks, four hours at two times speed, lift weights for one hour, walk for one hour while listening to audiobooks, and still have five hours worth of leisure time at the end of the day, most of which I dedicate to this channel. On the weekends, more time is poured into this channel and reading, and I break up the day by catching up with friends and family. All of life's menial tasks are done while I'm listening to audiobooks, excluding showers, which is my reflection time. Showers are a great time to reflect due to sensory and technological deprivation. With a working schedule and accounting for multitasking, I can average 10 hours of self-improvement per day. On highly motivated weekend days, I can net 16 hours of self-improvement. I agree, this is probably taken to the extreme, but if I can manage 10 hours with a full-time job and a YouTube channel, then you can easily manage two to three. This could easily be accomplished by listening to self-improvement books from the moment you wake until you get to work and from the moment you leave work until you get home. For most, that will total one to two hours right there. Add another one hour of physical exercise and you have met your quota. For other ideas on how to make this happen, see episode nine on smart multitasking. None of my achievements would be possible without this concept. When scheduling in your learning time, understand that the brain works better at different times for different things. For morning larks, they will be better at solving logical problems first thing in the morning. And for night owls, they will be better solving logical problems late in the evening. Interestingly, the opposite is the case for solving your creative problems. Your brain is best equipped to solve creative problems at your non-optimal time of the day. This is known as the inspirational paradox. Morning larks will be better at solving creative problems in the evening. And night owls will be better at solving creative problems first thing in the morning. Use this to your advantage. If you are a busy person, schedule your most important work, which usually requires vigilance and clear thinking, into your peak operating time, and push your less important work, or the tasks that benefit from creativity, to a time when you know that your brain is not operating at its peak. Do not let mundane tasks creep into your peak period if you can help it. The best gauge for judging your daily progress on the abilities and knowledge you have learned is to reflect each night before you go to sleep. Compare yourself now to who you were when you woke up this morning. Are you closer to greatness? Thanks for watching today's episode. In episode 29, I'll be discussing your responsibility when it comes to birth control. Subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when it drops. Catch you then.